Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Morning Musings here on Now TV and Happy New Year to you. Have you already broken your New Year's resolution? <laughs> uh, you know, people sometimes ask me, hey, Don, what's your New Year's resolution going to be? And I tell them invariably, years and years and years ago, I made one New Year's resolution that in the coming new year, I was going to do my dead level best to understand the word of God more and better and to understand the mind of God and his love for us more and better. Never changed the resolution, and I've never broken that resolution, by the way. So uh, we, we sometimes joke about New Year's resolutions, but some of them, you know, are really important. And I think my New Year's resolution, which, like I said, I've been making now for at least 50 years, uh, I think it is a fantastic resolution. It is one that has motivated me, it has driven me, and it has gratified me, I must say, in many, many ways. Because that New Year's resolution, striving to understand the Word of God, striving to know the Word of God more, has enabled me to write 35 books so far. I'm not suggesting that I'm perfect or that the books are perfect. I'm simply suggesting that my drive, my initiative, my desire to know the Word of God better has produced these books that are my effort to share my understanding of the Word of God with you and to hopefully prompt you to study more as well. So anyway, with that said, I uh, hope you had a fantastic Christmas. Hope you had, you know, hope Santa Claus was really good to you. I'm wearing one of my, uh, one of my Santa Claus presents, a really, really nice sweater and a brand new shirt under it. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I like nice shirts and um, I really like, I, I love sweaters. And so um, when I get the opportunity and when my wife is kind enough to buy me some, and these are Ariat, uh, the shirt is Ariat, by the way. I ab absolutely love Ariat products. I'm wearing Ariat boots. I'm wearing Ariat shirt. And this is a unpaid <laughs> an announcement here and commercial, if you please, but they make really super good products. Okay. So anyway, I hope you got what you wanted for Christmas. Hope your new year is starting off fantastic. Good to have you back, and it's good to be back. I took the week off from, you know, just before Christmas until now. So here we are. All right. We are continuing our study of the challenge of Christ. John chapter 10, verse 37. If I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. But if I do the works which my Father has given me, then believe me. Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my works. That's obviously a paraphrase, but you get the point. As some commentators have noted, Jesus was willing to stake everything about his entire mission on whether he did what he said he was going to do. And yet, what's interesting, revealing, is that some scoffers, some antagonists of this channel, have written some of the most vile, ugly, vitriolic things that you can imagine, saying, oh, that challenge of Christ has nothing to do with eschatology. Seriously? Uh, I've been told that the challenge of Christ only applied to his resurrection. I wonder where you'd find that, that claim so supported in the Bible. Well, the only reason, you see, somebody would make such a ridiculous claim is because they know they don't believe Jesus kept his word. They don't believe that Jesus came back in the first century in flaming fire on the clouds with the angels to reward every man. They don't believe he did that. Therefore, the challenge of Christ, they cannot allow for one moment the challenge of Christ to apply 
to Christ's second coming, to his parousia, the judgment, the resurrection. This is a kind of a case of cognitive dissonance, if you please. They know very good and well, to reiterate, Jesus did not keep his word to come back in the first century if, if this is critical, if he was predicting that he was coming back as a five foot five Jewish man on a cumulus cloud to put an end of time to destroy heaven and earth. They know he didn't do that. And so they have to say, oh, well, the challenge of Christ doesn't apply to the coming of Christ. By the way, I am currently involved. I just finished writing a rather lengthy critique and response uh, to an excellent scholar by the name of Elton Holland. Uh, Dr. Holland has been very gracious toward me uh, in his comments about my work, about my ministry. He disagrees, but he's been a true gentleman in his critique. He, he somewhat recently wrote an article on what he considers to be the fallacy of full preterism. Since it was a full, a real scholarly work, one of the very first genuinely scholarly articles to address the full preterist view, I felt it necessary to go in depth and to respond to Dr. Holland in the same way that he responded to me. He does cite me a couple of times in his article. So I've just finished that article here. It's, you know, January the 1st. And so uh, I'm sorry, it's not January the 1st. <laughs> it's the 1st of January. And so I, I have begun posting that article. It's going to be at least three installments, perhaps four, okay? So it will be found on donkpreston.com in installments, as well as I will be posting it in installments on academia.edu. So you can look for that because I believe it very important that we be able to answer the most scholarly works out there in a, that attempt to refute covenant eschatology. Now, with that said, again, we've been examining the challenge of Christ. We've been focused on Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, demonstrating that Daniel set the time, the appointed time. He doesn't use the Greek word kairos in the Septuagint, but he does say 70 weeks are determined. Katash, if I pronounce that properly, probably didn't. But it means that God looked down through the stream of time and he said, from here to here, I have appointed this time for the rebuilding of the temple. Oh, for the making of the atonement, to put away sin to finish transgression, to seal vision and prophecy. Six constituent elements God gave that were to be accomplished by the end of the 70th week. Now, let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, I have produced an extensive DVD series on when did or will the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9 come to an end. I have it produced and available in DVD form, MP3 form, or in download off of my website. Just go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. Go to the store and just look up Daniel chapter 9. When did or will the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 end? You can find that in the uh, electronic versions and what have you. Now, I say all of that because I don't know of a, I don't know another study anywhere closely related to what I've done in this series. And it's all related, ladies and gentlemen, to the challenge of Christ. Why? Well, because Yahweh set the time for the fulfillment of all prophecy. That's what seal, vision, and prophecy means. I wrote a book on this years ago entitled Seal, Vision, and Prophecy. And I demonstrate from a wide, wide, wide range of scholarship that virtually everyone, virtually everyone, now there's some, some dissenters, but virtually everyone agrees. Yes, seal, vision, and prophecy meant to bring the prophetic office to an end by the fulfillment of all prophecy. 
So what's the challenge of Christ? The challenge of Christ is that if he did not do what he said he was going to do, we are not supposed to believe in him. One of the things, some of the things that he said he was going to do, come back in the first century in the judgment of the living and the dead to establish the new heaven and new earth. And people go, well, look around. I don't see a new heaven and new earth. If this is the new heaven and new earth, I don't want any part of it. That's the way people very commonly react because they have a presuppositional view of the last days. They have a literalistic, physical, may I use the term, carnal view of the nature of the coming of the Lord, judgment, and resurrection. And just like the first century Jews had a carnal, materialistic, physical, national concept of the coming of Messiah to be the king, they rejected Jesus because he said, my kingdom is not of this world. And because he rejected their offer to be the kind of king they wanted him to be. John chapter 6, verse 15. Do you see the train coming here, ladies and gentlemen? Daniel 9 set the time for the fulfillment of all prophecy. Jesus said his coming, the judgment, the resurrection. And remember, all of those things would be the consummative fulfillment of all prophecy. I do not know of a single scholar, do not know of a single commentator that would disagree with the claim that the resurrection is the time of the fulfillment of all prophecy. Not one. Okay? So here's Daniel saying 70 weeks are determined to, fill, to fulfill all prophecy. Jesus was saying his coming judgment and resurrection, you know, to fulfill all prophecy would be in the first century. This is where we come to the challenge of Christ. I mentioned this, Dr. Holland. Dr. Holland believes that the New Testament dichotomizes between the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming of the Lord. Mm. Pardon me. They believe that that's found in Mark chapter 13. In the article that I just mentioned, I just proved that. But the point of it is here, you see, in Daniel chapter 9, the time of the fulfillment of all things is the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, the overwhelming flood, the end of the 70 weeks. Got to repeat this. The end of the 70 weeks is at the end of the desolation of Jerusalem. Daniel 9, 27 in the Septuagint. At the, pardon me, at the appointed time of the end, Pardon me. Suntalia Cairo, Cairo, the appointed consummation. The end of the appointed time. Well, what's the appointed time? The 70 weeks. So Daniel was told the end of the appointed time, the end of the 70 weeks. Now watch this. At the end of the appointed time, the end of the desolation will be brought. Desolations would not end until the end of the 70 weeks. Set the end of the 70 weeks is the end of the desolation of Jerusalem. That means the 70 weeks did not end in AD 34 or 35. It means that all prophecy was fulfilled in the fall of Jerusalem, the end of the 70 weeks. Okay? Going back over territory, this is so wonderfully important. So we've been focused on Revelation chapter 11 since it is a prediction of the time of the resurrection. Daniel 9 is a prophecy of the fulfillment of all prophecy, which is the time of the resurrection. Now remember, Daniel 9 set the end of the 70 weeks when? At the destruction of Jerusalem. Now watch this. Since it's been a while since I went over this, I'm going to repeat it because it's so critical. In Revelation chapter 10, 6 and 7, in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, 
There should be no more delay. But the mystery of God foretold by the prophet should be fulfilled and that there should be no more delay. So, sounding of the seventh trumpet. How many trumpets are there in Revelation? How many trumpets sound in the book of Revelation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What happens in the days of the seventh trumpet? All prophecy is fulfilled. Revelation 10, 6, and 7. Oh, but wait. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 and following. In the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the song of victory is sung in heaven, and the song is, Blessed are you, O Lord God, because the time of your wrath has come. And you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. By the way, there are those who, who claim that the millennium began in AD 70, that Jesus didn't really honestly begin ruling and reigning, and certainly not in the millennium until AD 70. So they posit the beginning of the millennium in AD 70 because they go to Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 19, 28, Matthew 25, 31, at the coming of the Son of Man in his glory, then, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. And they say, well, see, it says that's when he would sit on his throne. Well, that's to misunderstand the nature of Hebraic thought. I won't go into it. I'm writing a book on it. But notice, if then shall he sit on the throne of his glory, means he wasn't reigning before then, then Revelation chapter 11 15 to following says, you, speaking of the Father, you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. That's the majority translation of that text. So let me ask you, since Revelation 11 says God, the Father, had begun to reign at the time of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, does that mean that he wasn't reigning before that? It must, according to the idea that Matthew 25, 31 has Jesus beginning his reign. See, it just doesn't work, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, to continue, I had to, you know, had to do that. So in the sounding of the set of the seventh trumpet, what do you have? It's the time of the dead that they should be judged. What is that? Resurrection. That agrees perfectly with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 52, what, what happens in 1 Corinthians 15, 52? Oh, the sounding of the seventh, or excuse me, the sounding of the last trumpet. Let's see, last trumpet, resurrection. Revelation 11, 15 and following, seventh trumpet, which is the last trumpet, resurrection. Okay? And we've talked about how Revelation chapter 11 also posits the time of the rewarding of the prophets. Now, where is all of this positive? Where does the biblical writer posit the fulfillment of this seventh trumpet? Well, Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, is very, very clear. 11, 8 and following right up to verse 14, through verse 14, the sounding of that seventh trumpet occurs at the destruction of the judgment of the city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. It is also where our Lord was crucified. Now, let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. Point number one, what city in all of the Bible in all of the Bible, was ever called, spiritually called, Sodom. There's only one city that was ever designated spiritually as Sodom, and that is in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10, O covenant Jerusalem. It is in Ezekiel chapter 23, several times in that chapter. Only one city in all of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is ever called Sodom. How do we then come to Revelation chapter 11, 
which is about the destruction of Babylon, you know, the city called Sodom. How do we come to that and say, oh, well, uh, Babylon had to be Rome? No, it didn't. In Deuteronomy 32, 32, the Song of Moses, we are told that in Israel's last days, three times in the chapter, we are told this song is about Israel's last days. It says that in Israel's last days, they have become the vine of Sodom. That's Israel. It's not the nations. It's not Rome. Rome didn't exist at the time. Not the Roman Catholic Church. Roman Catholic Church didn't exist at the time. It is talking about Israel in her last days would become the vine of Sodom. Folks, how do we ignore this testimony? All right? How do we ignore it? Then it is the city, quote, where the Lord was crucified. Now, I won't go into calling Jerusalem spiritually uh, Egypt, but Paul did. Paul did. Abraham did. Genesis does. I won't go into it, okay? Nonetheless, here's the deal. There is no city in all of the world other than Old Covenant Jerusalem, which is where the Lord was crucified. Greg Beale, in his extensive commentary, New International Critical Commentary, uh, on New International Greek Commentary on the New Testament, the book of Revelation, goes into the most convoluted, confusing discussion to try to explain away how Sodom, Egypt, and where the Lord was crucified was not, in fact, Old Covenant Jerusalem. It is amazing to read his attempt to argue that away and to dismiss it and to make it applicable to, you know, every, every evil city, every wicked city, and to apply it to some imaginary end of time. And, you know, I'm moving around a lot here because I get excited talking about this. It is absolutely amazing what the commentators do to, it, to explain away the plain meaning of the text. So, in the days of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, you have Jerusalem, Sodom, and Egypt, and where the Lord was crucified, destroyed. But in the sounding of the days of the seventh trumpet, you have the resurrection. Okay, that agrees perfectly with Daniel chapter 9. The 70 weeks would be fulfilled at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now you have the seventh trumpet, the time of the fulfillment of all prophecy, which is Daniel chapter 9, at the time of the destruction of the city where the Lord was crucified. Folks, the harmony here, the beauty here of connecting these dots is, is basically, to me, logically coercive. And it's logically overwhelming. I can't find a way out of this. Now, when we see this harmony and we see this beauty, we have a choice to make. When we look at the challenge of Christ, we have a choice. In Jesus' prediction of his second coming judgment resurrection, was he talking about an end of time event in which all the dead bodies of every human being who has ever lived, decomposed and gone into the into the dust. And I was just reading Steve Gregg this morning uh, in regard to his view of the resurrection. He says, in the resurrection, God gives us bodies made from the decomposed dust of the mortal bodies in which we previously lived. Now, that's the standard view, ladies and gentlemen. And many philosophers and scholars down through the years have posed the question, okay, I've got a cup of coffee or made of water, okay? Do you realize that atoms from countless numbers of people who have lived and died are in that cup of coffee? And somebody says, oh, what's your point? The point of it is, 
every single one of us, the body that I'm in right now, is composed and comprised of the mole molecules, the dust, if you please, the atoms of countless human beings who have gone before. I don't have my own distinctive atoms, molecules, etc. It is not mere, merely a philosophical question to ask if my entire body, if my entire biological existence is comprised of the molecules of countless millions and billions of individuals who have died and decayed and gone into the dust or in the sea, and if I do not have any distinctive molecules of my own, then how does God not create a brand new body for me? Which, by the way, Steve Gregg denies. And again, look, philosophers and Bible students have pondered this for years and years and years. But again, the point of it is, this is all related to the challenge of Christ. If we take this literal, physical, biological view of resurrection, then guess what? Daniel was wrong to posit it at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Revelation was wrong to posit it at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. That's the challenge of Christ, isn't it? Now, here's something amazing. Daniel got his prediction of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 absolutely correct. <laughs> John got his prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem very, very soon absolutely correct. So if Daniel, and by the way, Jesus and Mark and Matthew and blah, 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 if all of these biblical writers got their prediction of the time of the resurrection, the context and the framework of the resurrection, i.e. the fall of Jerusalem, if they got that correct, then how did they miss the resurrection prophecy so horribly? I suggest they didn't but I'm out of time. See you next week.